Welcome to the Eclectic Gamers Podcast. Today is Sunday, the 13th of October. This is episode 230. I am Tony. I am Dennis. And I am afraid that we have a new game to talk about. Yay! I'm but, so sorry, everybody. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, be forewarned. Uh, neither of us are thrilled with it. So if that's all you need to know, you can stop the podcast here. But we got a lot of stuff to go over in the sense that we actually have, I believe, three listener emails. One in the video game section, two in the pinball section. And, of course, we're going to cover the new uh, game from Dutch, pinball exclusive. And, of course, there are some video game news. But before we get into any of that... Tony, it's been a couple weeks. You were, I think you hit us with like a laundry list of games you had been playing. Oh, yeah, last, last time. time. And, it was. And since then, I've only been playing Satisfactory. Oh, that okay. is like it since then because I, 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 I finished, I had beaten, well, I completed Dredge. Right. Uh, and I completed Space Marine 2. What about the, oh, wait, I was going to say, what about Big Brutus? But that's what you went and visited. That's what I went and visited. Yes. Yeah. That was your trip. That so was, no fun that, trip that since then? No fun trip since then. No no, nothing like that. I've been I've been mainly uh, working on Satisfactory and, and working on some stuff around the house. And, mm. and I am continuing to evolve my camping rig uh, so I can start doing more trips and doing some more camping. Uh, but mainly... It's just been normal stuff. I did just start rewatching a show that I that came out a while ago, uh, The Longmire. Uh, I don't know uh, it. Longmire. It's a, a, a TV show. I'm pretty sure I've talked about it in the past because I've read the, all of the books. And the TV show is um, one of those things where it's like, oh, this is a really interesting idea. We really like these books. So let's take these characters and then throw everything else away. But unlike most things that turn into utter crap, it's actually really good on its own as long as you don't plan on it being exactly like the books. Hmm. So they're both very good things, but they're, it's all the whole Wyoming Western cowboy sheriff okay. guy in the modern times type thing. I mean, that's my advice to people that like with rings of power. It's like if you're <laughs> hung up on it needing to be lore accurate to what happened like in the Cimmerillion, which I didn't read. I've, I'm not a huge Tolkien reader. I, I like the lore, though. They've taken a lot of liberties with it, but I still find the show pretty entertaining if you can check that out. But you had to do the same thing with the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah. It's like there are a lot of change ups versus oh, yeah. like Frodo and Sam go completely like different places and stuff in the books uh, versus what happens in the movies. And it's like you can either just go along for the ride or you can obsess about how it wasn't your perfect literary world translated perfectly into film. Yeah, no, and I think it's definitely well worth the ride. I will say the other interesting thing that I, I've done is I have started uh, – I'm I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure I've spoken on here before about me having some sleep issues uh, uh, and all of that. I have started doing a bunch of like like listening to like ASMR sleep video things on like the YouTube, but they're ones that they're lore related. Mm -hmm. So it's somebody doing ASMR talk with like a campfire background or a storm in the background, whatever. But while talking about lore for like video games and stuff like that. And I, I I've come up across a couple that I, that I really like, like one of them he does like, like he has one that's like the entire background history of halo. And I actually ended up turning it off because, uh, I was so interested. I didn't. I, uh, I, I, hmm. I was started actively fighting to sleep because I I was listening to the lore because it was so good. Uh, and he's got a whole bunch of Warhammer 40k ones. And then I found another guy recently uh, that I've been listening to that it's set up to be very much like a um, like the oral tradition history of stuff. So it's less of like a lore dump type video and more of uh, like a background story that's like you're being told around a campfire. So he's got like one um, that he's released recently that's based around Dune where it's like the backstory uh, of the myth leading to the creation of their whole mythos waiting for the Lees and I Al Gaib mm. to come forward. Uh, and he's got some other ones that are based around uh, Lord of the Rings, where it's talking about some of the stuff like from Cimmerillion, but as like an oral tradition. So it's not exactly reading them off the book. It's more of like it's a story being told around a campfire. And in the background, there's campfire and there's animals and this and that. Mm -hmm. And the story's told over the course of 
uh, an hour or two and then everybody goes to sleep and it's just background sounds and like a campfire crackling and stuff like that for like another eight hours. Hmm. So, or well, or like another six hours. So it's like an eight hour thing. So there's still always a little background, like, like relaxation stuff going on, but it opens with like an oral history story and then kind of trails off. And then, and those, those have been really interesting too. So, uh, and I, I've been sleeping extremely well, actually. Oh, well, good. <laughs> I mean, I didn't wake up today until almost six. And for me, mm. that's amazing. It is. Wow. The power of the campfire. Yep. With lore with in the lore. oral tradition. ASMR. <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, after our last episode, you had mentioned the Final Fantasy Pixel remaster. So I went ahead and bought that mm-hmm. for my uh, Xbox console and have been playing that since then. I finished Final Fantasy 1, which I was not able to win when I was a kid. Right. Uh, it was just too... And there is a big... Jo- like that... I had to go and leave. I thought I was missing certain. I like. I'm looking up guides. I could not beat the last boss, and then I was just like, I needed like five more levels. Basically. You had to grind. Yeah, grind. I, I had the spells and equipment that they recommended, uh, which was good because I sold off a lot of stuff, um, and some of this was just stuff you had to find. Um, but I did happen to still have all the key things that they had recommended, and so yeah, I just I left the place and went back, and that was enough encounters that it actually got me up to where I needed to be. So. Were you? Did you remember to keep the most powerful sword in the game so you could throw it at him and dart him with it? No, <laughs> I didn't dart him with it, but I did. Uh, I did hit him with it a lot because actually there was some. Uh, there was an item and some magic that you could do. You could uh, keep casting uh, or using this item on the guy with that sword, and it exponentially apparently it stacks. The game never tells you this, but right. it stacks, and so you could actually like make him like exponentially stronger every time you applied it to him. But I actually ended up doing that to my black belt, which, all right, these remaster games, I, mean, I, have, I have a complaint about them. All right, they have they have some quality of life improvements. Uh, you can turn off encounters uh, so that if you're going back and forth and all these mazes and stuff, which is part of the reason I was five levels too low, because sometimes I'd just be like, I'm turning these off because I'm going to run out of magic. All right. And it's like, you have to leave to get magic back unless you have potions, which were super expensive. So... Not to belabor it, but one of the things is they when you go to equip stuff, there is an optimal button, and it will optimize what the people can wear. So in the first game, I was doing that and be like, it puts the best weapon, best sword on the fighter, it puts the best staff on the mage, you know, things like that. Well, I'm going along, and I my party was white mage, black mage, fighter, and monk, and. Monk was just he was getting worse. Like I'm just going along, and not like. Not like he was doing less damage. It was just he was not on pay. Like he would take a ton of damage when he was hit, which uh, his, his only weapon were were nunchucks. Mm-hmm. So he has these like he started with wood nunchucks. I got him iron nunchucks. I'm like 10 hours into the game. He's still got iron nunchucks and I'm not finding anything for him. And I'm just I'm going along and it's just uh, I, finally I just looked up. And I'm like, is there like a place that has like some special ultimate weapon for him or something that I just don't know about? Because I can't, you know, no stores have anything for him. And, uh, <laughs> and cause and he's wearing like certain, basically can wear what the mages wear, mm-hmm. like cloth armor. So anyway, look it up, see a little, a little discussion thing. And it's like, oh no, 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 no. Dennis, 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 Dennis. You don't, he doesn't wear anything. What's wrong with you? The whole point of nunchucks is for the starting game when his stats aren't working the way they're supposed to because he's too low level. His damage, his attack, is 2x his level if he's barehanded. Otherwise, he's limited to what the weapon is. He's better than any weapon. (laughs) So he's like level 35 now, so he's supposed to have a base attack of 70. And I'm... And I, so it's just like I took it off. All of a sudden, he's doing more damage than fighter. Everything just <laughs> melted. And you the armor in hard mode. Well, in the armor, because it's showing like it's like the armor is showing like better defense. Like, no, take his armor off. Don't have him wear clothes. He's better. His evasion becomes impressive at this point. So no one can touch him because he's a he's a monk. <laughs> so anyway, he's actually who killed the final boss. I stacked everything on him. A lot of people don't play with monk because it's not the default four. It's thief instead of monk, but I swapped it. Yeah. So anyway, 
So when are you going to do the speed run cleric playthrough? <laughs> with four clerics. I, I know. I remember Nintendo Power talking about the four white mage playthrough. Um, but I, I don't. <laughs> Maybe after I get through the other games. So I'm in Final Fantasy 2, the original 2, not the 2 in America that was 4. Correct. So I don't know this game. I'd never played it before. I thought I was going to finish yesterday, but I'm not done. You yet. thought wrong. Because I went and I fought the Emperor, and I won. And then... The emperor's right hand man took over the empire, so I went and confronted him. But now the emperor is back. Somehow he returned. Yeah. Well, no, he was pretty. It's like, you know, it can't be. And he's like, I, I think he literally says, "Yeah, I'm back from hell." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, well, I mean, to be fair, I, we didn't consider that option, but but apparently, Final Fantasy II, that's a thing. So, yeah, he's much more powerful now. Yeah, no, he's so." So anyway, so I'm playing that. Um, He's got the event horizon behind him. Yeah, it, it, it you know it was pixely, but um, but he, his his appearance was as grandiose as you would have expected from an '80s game. So I so, am home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if only they had hired some voice acting. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I fought him, uh, he did do, I think, uh, no, some, some of the enemies blind you all the time. And there's a very much, you won't need eyes to see. <laughs> some of, but I used to, in the first game, I, I would ignore blindness because I could still hit everything when I was blind because <laughs> I didn't need eyes to see, apparently. <laughs> Everyone still hit everything, but it was weird. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and jump into the pinball section. And I'm actually going to open with one of the emails. So Brent R. wrote in. Thank you, Brent. We appreciate it. And let me see where we're at with that to make sure I am good to go. And yes. All right. Hey, Tony and Dennis. I wanted to write about my experience with the Uncanny X-Men pinball game, the LE specifically. I didn't watch the gameplay stream that Stern did, only saw the trailer beforehand, so I didn't know about the feedback of the shots being hard to make. I can say that the shots are very makeable, but this is a machine that must be properly set up correctly. The machine I played on had one of the shots, which was which is the shot next to the left ramp, being makeable, but it didn't go all the way through the kitty lane like it was supposed to. Also, the shots around the sentinel head could only be made with one of the flippers, but not the other one. The code is really bare bones at this point in time with completing the eight missions just sends you what to what I coined as the endless future mode. The bishop action button needs clarification to properly use it since on the machine it says press it, but it's more like hold it down action button. No. It reminds me of the awkwardness of the spider sense in Venom since that one was hold it and then press it. Uh, overall, I feel like X-Men has the mar makings of being a great game, but the code isn't there and the machine must be properly set up to make the shots. If comparing to Jack Danger's other game, Foo Fighters, I felt like Foo Fighters immediately hit it out of the park with how the game was more complete compared to X-Men, which is really bare bones at the moment. Also, this is the first time I've really played a Stern Premium LE first before the Pro, which for me is I usually play the Pro first and then later on finding a place that has the Premium, since the area I played in usually gets Pros and never really Premiums. Keep up the good work, Brent. Well, thank you, Brent, for giving us some feedback, because Tony and I still have not had the opportunity to play the Uncanny X-Men. I believe it is going to 403 Club. I want to think I saw... I don't know if it's there yet. Though. Right. I think I read an announcement because the plan, I believe, is they're getting rid of James Bond and bringing that in. Because apparently, people were upset about losing James Bond. I guess the attorney people like where the rules are at. Oh, well, I mean, okay. It's been... I mean, I haven't played James Bond since we did that uh, pinball awards thing at Zach's Barn. Oh, was that two, two years, years ago? ago? Yep, yeah. two years ago, because we didn't do the... Uh, we didn't do the awards for the uh, for for the last year. So anyway, again, that was you. the fun road trip. You like all road trips. I do. I that's love road like trips. That's why you're like into camping and stuff. I love road trips. I just like driving. I just like adventure. It's like that's your quest. That's like your dragon quest without the slimes. Yes. But maybe someday there will be slimes. We don't know. Maybe. What? It could be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be one of those things where it becomes one of those lit RPG books where suddenly the world is turned into a RPG <clears> thing and you get an inventory and, and leveling and abilities and mm -hmm. all that stuff. That's an I've entry. been re I've, I've, I'm still, I'm still going through the dungeon crawler, Carl. Books. Oh, okay. They're so funny. <laughs> oh God. They're so funny. I actually was late getting here because I was in it in the middle of a fight scene. And yes. You were very late. I, I drove around the block twice. <laughs> 
<laughs> to finish to finish the fight. Uh, I literally was like, "Oh, here's the turn to go onto Dennis's road. I'm just gonna go all the way straight to the next main road, and then I'll drive around. The fight's still going on. I'll go all the way to the next main road and drive around. And and, and I did that twice. Yes, because like, because the audio wouldn't play if you parked. No, well, it, it, I just. <laughs> It would have. I just didn't want to stop in the middle of your driveway and then just sit out there and wait for a battle to end. Or mm-hmm. and I didn't, but I did really. It, I I was laughing so hard I didn't want to turn it off in the middle of the fight either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Understandable. Well, speaking of things you won't want to turn off, let's talk about DPX's <laughs> latest hit game. Wow. <laughs> okay, so for those that don't, this is our one pinball topic. Um, we have a new reveal though, so we're going to go into it. Dutch pinball exclusive, also known as DPX, 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 has finally done their full reveal of their game, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I do have a link in the show notes uh, to an article with the Kineticist if you would like to read about this actual release and look at some of the photos, because obviously this is an audio medium. Here are the key highlights for people that are or what you're going to mostly want to know about if you don't know anything about the game. So this started as a John Popertuk prototype design. It never got past the foam core stage. The foam core image is fairly famous. And uh, this was back when he had his company Zidware trying to make games. This goes back to 2011. So this concept has been around for a very long time. Uh, one of the things that really started to get a lot of attention before the game itself was fully revealed was it has a lot of sculpts rather than flat plastics. Lior from Art of Pinball did the sculpts for the game. So those got a lot of positive attention up front. Uh, a lot of the original art concepts were redone. For those that don't know, Zombie Yeti, a.k.a. Or I should say that's his well, also known. His real name is Jeremy Packer, who he does art for Stern now. However... He did art for some of the Zidware stuff, and it was that art, in particular, I'd say the back glass for Alice in Wonderland, which is what it was called back when J-Pop, or as John Papaduke is commonly just shorthand referred to as, uh, was having that game done. So originally it was a a Jeremy Packer art package. However, uh, there have been changes up to that in moving to this DPX production run, not done by Jeremy Packer. Uh, Team Pinball did the code. You might recognize Team Pinball from... They did, I think, uh, Punny Factory was their rule set. Uh, They also did that Mafia game. That was their first game, which they also built and coded. But since then, I believe, if I'm thinking correctly, Team Pinball has only been uh, oriented around doing software. Uh, The design of the layout is credited to Melvin Brewer-Williams, who I believe owns the rights to this game, uh, after acquiring them, and Barry Dryson. I might be mispronouncing those, so I apologize about that. However, when you look at it, a lot of this layout is very much straight up what J-Pop came up with. The game is limited to 500 units. Approximately 300 of those are slated for U.S. shipment, and the other 200 are to remain in Europe. It is a two-flipper layout. It does have multiple multi-balls. It has an upper play field, which takes up a significant amount of real estate uh, with two magna flippers, and it has a lot of RGB lighting. So, Tony. I've included in our internal notes a few of the images, but of course you've seen a lot about this already. We've both seen the reveal trailer. We did not watch the live stream uh, footage, which I have seen a number of summaries of, and I can only describe as disastrous. So I'm not linking to it because I don't know if maybe I should just so simply people can see just how bad this might actually be. Um, I am not thrilled with this, but I'd like to know your thoughts and you could start wherever you want. I'll tell you where a lot of people are starting, and that's the art package. I'm not going to start with the art package. Good. I'm going to start with, don't support anything coming out of Zidware. But they claim it this doesn't is matter. A, they it claim it's matter. not Zidware. This is, and John Papaduke wasn't involved in the DPX development. Right. It, it's just looks all. It, it just looks almost identical to the form, foam core, and they and is referred to as all. No. Well, Melvin bought the rights, it, but it doesn't matter. Melvin it got a Melvin. Matter. These are still, there are people out there who are out a lot of money from the Zidware stuff. There are people out there who who have suffered for years and years, and you're still building, you're trying to build your brand on the back of people that you've broken. Dutch Pinball, who, let's be honest, had a rough open launch, but they made they made their people right. They brought everything back. They did the kind of stuff mm-hmm. that none of us, at least none of me, 
thought they possibly could. And they did a very good job of that. And then they started their little their, their little DPX thing, and the yes. first thing they drop is is something they're trying to resurrect from Zedware. I think it's just absolutely horrible. I think it's a slap in the face to the community. I think it's a slap in the face of the hobby as a whole. I think it's an absolutely just monstrous choice. Well, um, I would I would attempt to play devil's advocate for the entertainment value. The problem is, uh, last week uh, on the pinball show, I already brought this up as my chief concern, so I can't really, because anyone who heard that yes. would be like, why are you talking out both sides of your mouth? And I cannot give in to the aroma of What's hypocrisy. that I smell no. coming no. from the other side of the table? <laughs> is that the stench of hypocrisy? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I so I will not. I I have to. I agree. I get it. Barry bought or not Barry? Excuse me. Melvin bought the rights to this uh, this property, the Zidware version of it. The next to nothing's changed, so it's not been a true reimagining. Not in my view. This uh, what you've said, I believe, is is completely accurate. This stuff from Zidware. Just it doesn't deserve to live, and so for that reason, there's just come up with something new. Take the theme if you love the theme, Alice in Wonderland. Take the theme and do it, but quit trying to make us take J pop back. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland has to be open. Oh, yeah, use. oh, yeah, there's no. no reason they had to take this version of it. No, he he. Melvin chose to buy the rights to this. So here is my problem with it is there is a I don't know if it's just a desire to prove it can be done or if it's just a love of J-pop and 90s pinball and everything about it, because there are some people who love the stuff. from. I mean, John Papaduke's Bally Williams games, World Cup soccer aside, sell for a lot of money, like high dollar money. Tales of the Arabian Nights, uh, Circus Voltaire, Theater of Magic. Those are all some of the most expensive non-remade Bally Williams games that are out there. And there's a certain style that he had. A lot of it is tied, I think, to the art and not so much the gameplay, but, you know, it it is what it is. I So, no, I... I don't disagree. I wholeheartedly agree. I don't want to see any of these Zidware things coming back from other companies. It does. They don't deserve to live they, as concepts. They don't. Yeah, they don't. So, so that in of itself, it just feels. I, I don't know. Sort of arrogant in a way that I don't. I don't like. You know, there's a line between arrogance and uh, and confidence, and I just feel like this is this is crossing it. Here's another issue I have with it, given that the layout is so similar, not perfectly similar. I'm sure they had to try and figure out some stuff to, <clears throat> I'm now air quoting for people that can't see me because you can't see me because this is audio, make it work. And I'm using air quotes because I've heard that in the live stream, they had to take off the glass and start making shots by hand. That is not a good sign that your game is working right. It is not a good sign. Correct. Um, here's the thing. It looks so similar to what J-pop did. Um, I would like to quote the great Slam Tilt, Slam Tilt podcast host, Bruce Nightingale. I'm going to do my best Bruce Nightingale impression. Cash grab! Because it's like they put in the bare minimum amount of work on, uh, on the creativity front, on the engineering front, and instead it just seems like... I got the rights to this thing. What's the quickest way we can make money? We got to slap an art package on it that's going to feel like a J-pop art package, and we got to get it so that it quote unquote plays. But I don't want to go around like redesigning the ramps so they actually work. I don't want to contemplate whether an upper play field that takes up approximately what one third of the upper section of the game, closer to one half of the upper section. You think about it at the top third of the game, almost all of that is taken up by that upper play field. The majority of it, like 60, 70 percent. Yeah. With Magna Flippers, you've played Twilight Zone. You've played The Power. Now, here's I don't really like much of anything about Twilight Zone, period. But the the power play field is not the most fun part of that game. No. <laughs> and so but this is occupied by such a boring toy, if you want to call it a toy. I'm just going to call it what it is. Yet another upper play field that is an, it's extra non-fun. It reminds me of WWE with the slings as an upper play field. That wasn't fun. But I if you 
just play on the pl- power play field on t- Twilight Zone, and you'll know how unfun power play field is because of how Magna slings work, or Magna flippers work. Because they're not real flippers. Um, it's just it does not look fun to shoot at all, and apparently it doesn't shoot well, which is a problem. Is problem as as well. Do you have any thoughts on I guess the layout? Getting past the wrongness of the J-pop concept existing. Getting past the wrongness of that concept and and the the direct slap at the hobby for taking something like this and trying to do it. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't look like it flows at all. It doesn't look interesting uh, in a fun way. And it's hard to detach the layout and the way it in the way it, it it's put together just from the sheer insanity of the art package uh and there are things on this play field that once seen cannot be unseen mm-hmm. yes <laughs> i'm going to i'll point out some incongruities before kind of diving into the art and for me so here's where i think it's one strength is the sculpts and I see why they emphasized and did close-up shots mm-hmm. of all these Leora models of all these creatures and such. Because that's the only thing that looks like money was put into it. Yeah. Like, you see these sculpts. on, You see the, the topper sculpt. You see the sculpts on the play field. You see the bright colors. You know, the kind of the fancy caps to the pop bumper on the right and all that. And then you've just got these two humongous plastic ramps. Not habit trails. Plastic ramps. Now... Don't get me wrong. I love a good plastic ramp. The plastic ramps are one of my favorite things about Star Trek because plastic ramps mean speed, and speed means fun. But I can already tell this game isn't fun to play. So the problem is it just looks like, hey, well, J-Pop came up with plastic ramps. Should we? Hey, I just imagine the meeting. Hey, should we do things in metal? Uh, That's going to cost us some money. Let's just vacuum form some plastic real quick and slap it, slap it on. But we're going to surround it with sculpts and stuff. And you've got the flat plastic version of ramps uh, in its place. And I I just again, it just is like, well, we don't want to put too much effort in it. We're paying Lior. And that's like where all the whole budget went. So and and, and they're doing all that. And then they're still asking 12 five for it. 12.5. No, yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, reemphasize. I don't know if I said it at the start. I pro- I don't think I did. I think I said the limit of 500. But yeah, $12,500 for this thing. The art. You've mentioned there are things on the play field, innuendo things that cannot be unseen. You didn't mention innuendo, but we've discussed it off air. We've discussed we, it off we're, I'm, I'm, we don't want me to have to beep a whole lot on this episode. Correct. Now, let me let me mention this before you dive in, Tony. Okay. One of the things, because I've, I've read part of the pin side thread that's discussed this, and some of the defenders of this game, there are a few, some of the defenders have kind of argued against any of the critiques on the art package, uh, arguing that you're saying this because you're American and Americans are prudes. So I give you this to run with. Okay. And that's a perfectly valid argument for people to have and to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I believe the majority of the people, uh, alive at this time with a history, uh, and, and, and a knowledge of Alice in Wonderland, uh, most of that comes from the original Disney cartoon or any of the numerous remakes since most of which have been aimed more at a sense of whimsy and wonder. Uh, except for some of the like straight up hardcore Japanese porn, uh, hentai versions, uh, of it, which is definitely where this game has decided to pull its belief from, uh, the, the full on, (laughs) I'm trying to think, I'm trying to speak about this in a way that can actually be published because of how we try to keep this clean. It is very over the top sexualized in a way that we have not seen in pinball in a long time. Um, I think it's, it's over the top beyond even something like, whoa, Nelly, which felt like a joke, uh, poking at it where this feels like it's taking its, it, 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 it's overt sexualization very seriously. If you go from the, the simple art package, where uh, 
all of the women are in almost utterly destroyed clothes that don't that just barely if anything cover anything while they're all super busty and and like and the sides of the back like box the size of the, the back is the key box. area you're referring to right or or even the sides of the machine where everything is laid out super to the giant tramp stamp at the very bottom of the machine oh on the apron uh, on the apron uh to the upper play field that quite frankly is extremely phallic mm. and the inserts still leading to the scoop yes the inserts the, leading to the and scoop the, and the, the shape magna of, the, flippers, of the magna flippers the, the giant yes. blue spherical <laughs> magna flippers yes, yes. And, and the shape leading to the scoop I'm sorry that you see that now and you'll never unsee it because I saw it almost instantly the first time I looked at it. And once my laughing stopped, I've never been able to unsee mm. it. That's true. It will not be. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the phallic image in the, in the Gandalf on the Lord of the Rings, uh, translate that people can't unsee right. anymore. Yeah. Well, no, that one was an accident, right? Is, what do you think? This was an accident. There's, there is no <laughs> way on earth that this was an accident. They did not accidentally do this. <laughs> I mean, everything about this was designed specifically to be what it is. Sorry, I suggested it. <laughs> this sorry. isn't like this isn't the "How I Met Your Mother" episode uh, where there's the the big rounded building with two spherical <laughs> entrances at the bottom. Uh, uh, it it's it's no okay. the art package is. I will say that the like like it doesn't look like it's it, it it's clippy or weird or bad like it's not that the art it's like the choices made in the art is terrible but the quality of the art is fine with just what I consider very poor choices uh I'm just I was in shock when I originally saw it come out just how I don't even have a good word for it. Uh, the, 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 I, most of my original thoughts, I literally cannot say right. on our I podcast. Understand. I think people have gotten the, get the understanding of, of, of where you're going though. Yes. Right? And if they don't, they will when they look. Um, all right. So regarding the art, I'm going to, I don't. So if they want to go with sexy Alice, we'll just put it that way. They want to go with sexy Alice. I, I still am. I'm at a loss for some of the decision making. So, is this supposed to be a scary version of Alice? Just a just a sexy adult version of Alice, but otherwise it's Alice in Wonderland. Or, like, there's uh, there's an incongruity with, I guess, the direction that they're trying to go with. Like, I look at things like the sculpt of the Cheshire Cat on the top of the game, and I get the vibe that they wanted to do like a really dark and scary version of it. like. American McGee Alice, the, right. the video game, yeah. which I've played that. I've played that game. Yeah. And that game is fun. Um, but it's just dark. It's not it's not sexualized. Then I look at the sides of the of like the the cabinet, the sides of the back box, and I get this impression that it's a and I I'm stealing some of this from Pinside because there are other people that really dove into what their issues were with the art and trying to push back against in their version. Like they didn't care that it was trying to be um, you know, sexy versus not sexy. The pushback was more it doesn't fit the theme or they didn't like but the way that You don't the, like Red Sonia Alice? So I mean I, I've seen all <laughs> Or just the the the. I mean, I mean, I really enjoy the Red Sonia movie, but it's not how I think of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> yeah, there's some of that, and there's others. It's just in like uh, from people are like, this is not good art. Like arguments of they took uh, the fine line where, and you can you know in our internal notes, you can go back and kind of look at the translate, for example, that was done by Jeremy Packer. And, and some are like, they took all the fine line work and detail that Jeremy Packer did and gave it all the refinement of a t-shirt. I can see that. And so, or I've other, seen others say, this is exactly what you used to be able to go ahead and purchase off of deviant art. Like, this is what this looks like. Yeah, no, it doesn't look like Photoshop. It looks like deviant art. It looks like the fantasy of a 14 year old coming up with, Oh, do Alice in Wonderland, but do it edgy, sexy and edgy. And so here's art that's sexy and edgy. But then you get these weird uh, things like why is the why is the Queen of Hearts the same age now as Alice? Alice is all grown up, I guess. But so the Queen of Hearts is her sister. 
because they look to be the same age, which isn't, isn't, uh, you know, so they're like, it doesn't fit with the story. It just, it seemed like you put style over substance and the style in and of itself actually isn't very good. There's just a lot of color everywhere. And so you look at the play field and just stepping back and not looking too much at the detail, you just get a lot of color. So I think I've seen some people say the strongest thing on the, of the art is just a little bit above the flippers that shot with her walking that, that like, is like that. I can see you that know, kind sure. of reminiscent of how we really praised the uh, JJP avatar art and that different style. Like if something had been done like that with whimsy, there'd be something to get excited about. But this just is not. It's just it's just a bunch of stuff. That whole section looks like a completely different art style. Like that one section was done by somebody completely different mm. than the entire rest of the machine. I mean, maybe the art was. <laughs> was done by AI. I'll tell you what, I hadn't really thought much about it until you had asked me if, if the callouts had been done by AI. So let's move into that. We heard <laughs> a number of the callouts in the reveal trailer. Oh my God. Yeah. Guys, you know what? My rates aren't that high. I could have done better than this. I, yeah. It, I could have done better. It, it, it definitely. It, it felt very flat. It, it, it was just unexpectedly bad on pin side when it first came out i went back in the timeline and read some of those posts there i were believe multiple people asking were these placeholder callouts same thing has been asked asked for the uncanny x-men like are the programmers doing placeholder callouts right <laughs> but people are like wow this is worse than x-men and x-men has been dogged for its call both versions have been dogged for its callouts yeah um no again when I go back to that that Bruce impression of cash grab, it seems like they spent money on two things, buying the rights from Zidware to have the J-pop version and Lior for his sculpts. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they went to DeviantArt to grab their Alice, to grab their sexy Alice. Doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. Stuck her on the sides of the, of the play field and the back glass and then threw a bunch of color everywhere had their had Team Pinball record their callouts for them, or have the have Google AI do it? Uh, except it sounds a little rough even for Google's AI, and didn't bother other than to kind of get the game to play, get it engineered up and ready to go because you have to take the glass off to show how the shots work when you do a live stream. This is a mess. I I'm gonna open with or <laughs> we're at the end of this, but <laughs> I, I'm gonna open my final thoughts, Tony, with nice. saying this. Just in case, because some people, they really like, they're very sensitive to people judging what they do with their money. So I'm going to say it like this uh, with pinball or with any hobby, buy what you like. Don't buy something because I don't like it. That, that would be a silly. Don't listen. Don't, I hope you're not listening to me to make your buying decisions. I'm just going to give you my impressions on something. So you always need to do what's best for you. All that said, do not buy this game. This is not a good use of your money. This is not a good project to support. I don't understand why DPX is doing what they're doing. Uh, I don't like anything about this project other than the sculpts. And you know what? Contact Lior on the side if you want a, a weird, creepy Cheshire cat and see if he can sell you one or build you a custom thing or something. Um, but I would not get anything about this. Nothing about this is exciting. This does not advance pinball in any meaningful way. Uh, the only thing that this has done is given me and you, Tony, a, a good uh, item of discussion that had filled an otherwise fairly lackluster pinball episode. So those are my final thoughts. What would you like to say on this in finality? Because um, I don't know if we will ever revisit this again. We probably will. There's we're, you know, we're going to end up, so, we're going to end up talking about it again. I, 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 I don't, I don't even know where to start. Is it, it on your Christmas list, Tony? It, it's most definitely. I'm not, I, I don't recall the 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 art concepts were taken from the original and changed. Does did it list who did the actual art? I didn't. I don't recall seeing that in the in the in the article. Mm. They didn't put a name. They just yeah. No, I I don't. Not that nothing that I I recall. I'm. You know, going back and, and looking at it, <clears throat> in fact, because it was because Jeremy didn't want to be involved with this project. Uh, I think they they approached him and, and asked him about it. 
and he indicated, and I think he mentioned something publicly about how he just, he wasn't, he wasn't interested in going and revisiting this. So the art was credited to Freak Van Hagen, but I don't know if that's like a real name. But maybe, um, I mean, it's Freak Van Hagen is is associated with Dutch pinball, uh, according to the kineticist, and did stuff on the Big Lebowski. So they used their guy. I guess, or or that's a that's a name for a collaborated a collaborative, collaborative team. team. I don't know because uh, the name sounds Dutch Van Van Hagen. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but the bottom line is is it to me when you look at it, it's very clear that Zombie Yeti's approach was looked at and it was an inspirational model, but it's way blown out to deviant art proportions at this right. point. Right again, none of the subtlety of Jeremy's work like his. I I kind of like I'm not a big art expert, but like he did a lot of the Al, Allison Ware, kind of like Magic Girl. He did like really fine line work. I don't know that he does that normally for Stern, but like with those projects, there's still like a lot of nuanced detail that had been applied. It's that's not there anymore. No, none of that. None of this that's is, there. This is the this is the quality that you would expect to see on a T-shirt. I do think that's a fair comparison. Like this is airbrushed sort of stuff. So fitting, fitting with the thematic choice for Alice, I suppose. But yeah, I I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's okay. still better than clip art, I guess. I'm not saying it's much better, but to be fair, I've been completely burned out on the old clip art. I think over some the people years. do. People care about this theme. I don't think. Here's the thing is they obviously think people care about this theme. I don't know. Did you ever read Alice? I did. I didn't. I, I, I I've never did. read Lewis Carroll. I, 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 I've, I, I've read, I read, I read it and I mean, years and years and years and years ago, like in high school or yeah, probably high school it would have been. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't really see where it's some big draw the only reason i think it's a draw is because it's another one of the mythical zidware mm. projects that were going to be the perfect pinball wonderful super amazing thing uh of that giant you know scam mm. just like everything else that has come out of it and the fact that people are still feeding off uh, off of this trough is just disappointing to me. And the fact that people are still supporting it is disappointing to me. But I will say that, like Dennis said, it's your money. You can do what you want with your money. But at the same time, there are better things in pinball you could spend your money on than supporting something like this. Well, speaking of pinball... We have one last item. It's another listener email. Now, this one, I'm going to explain up front. I've taken the liberty of truncating the email because some of the elements aren't going to work for what uh, I'm going to provide here. Uh, it'll, it'll start to make sense. Uh, I, I almost I almost promise I can't guarantee that it'll make sense, but I think it'll make sense once I get through the email. But <clears throat> So this is from Rob F. So thank you, Rob F., for emailing in. Greetings and salutations, gentlemen. I think you know... Uh, I think you both will get a laugh out of this and possibly some easy pre-expo filler material for your next show. You probably have heard the recent news of Google's new LM Notebook AI tool, which has the unique capability of to create a podcast from user-provided source material. I tried this thing out by feeding four recent Napalcade articles related to upcoming title rumors from various manufacturers. Of course, the first genera general takeaway when you hear with this thing can may manifest out of thin air is terror coated in sweet wonder, just like a milk dud. It is fascinating how the podcast generator can fill its own unique perspectives and commentary beyond the source material provided, even if it misses on fine details. Case in point, and specifically why I wanted to share this, of what the AI muses could, nay should, be the next theme for Bears the Phone. It also makes a point to highlight this theme again in the summary. It is shockingly hilarious. P.S. If I get the choice character voice for the next read, I would request your pseudo-Batman. However... Dennis, I think you should really stretch your range and give Arnold Schwarzenegger a try. Or if it feels more natural to parody a parody, The Simpsons' McBain. Up and Adam, 
Thanks for the time you guys have putting into enjoyable content. Rob. All right. Sorry. That was <laughs> that was Arnold kind of. It wasn't. It was a, but it was what you get for that long of a thing. Holy cow. And it was even longer. Uh, there were some elements in the email, including the source material and such, and also some other references. Here's the thing. So Rob has sent me the audio of this Google LM Notebook AI Tools podcast. It was seven minutes long, and I cannot spare seven minutes uh, to subject everyone to it, though it is an interesting lesson. So Tony hasn't heard anything of it yet. I have taken, it's under a minute, I have taken, and I will overlay hopefully i'm going to try and play it for us here it's not going to pick up well with the mics but in post i'm going to try and overlay it but he wanted to know the live reaction so i'm going to play what got sent in so hopefully uh we can see your thoughts have you heard what barrels of fen is up to podcast. oh you know i have and i think i've got it their labyrinth uh, machine up here smash it uh, and here we go it proves you don't need a big name or a big budget to make a great pinball game exactly passion projects can really capture people's imaginations for sure and now that Labyrinth is winding down production, exactly. everyone's dying to know what they'll do next. I hear they might unveil their next game at the Texas Pinball Festival. Oh, a hometown reveal. That would be something special. Right. It'd be amazing. What do you think they'll go with for a theme? Well, if they're sticking with that Texas pride, maybe something with <laughs> cowboys, oil barons. Could you imagine a barbecue-themed machine? Now that's an idea. A little sausage is shooting out when you hit a ramp. Yeah. You play that. See? The possibilities are endless with pinball. Decided that the, the Texas hometown theme would make sense, but then they ended up with barbecue. So maybe he didn't feed enough in about the response to the barbecue from American Pinball. But just imagine little sausages, sausages shit now. When you shit the ramps, I'm just like, yeah, I remember watching the basting of meats. <laughs> the, the, the great pasty of meats at the last Texas Pinball Festival. <laughs> no. <clears throat> this is not a good tool for use. Never use this again. <sighs> the fact. And, and this is something that we're going to. I, I won't even go so far to say this is something we'll see more of. This is something we're seeing more of now. I've noticed it online, uh, even as much as on YouTube. Uh, a lot of channels I've noticed have started using uh, AI voiceovers. Uh, mm. And up to and including, I've even some that have gone so far as to cut away from the video that they're doing the voiceover of and to show like, an AI person talking. I've seen that. And then back to the voiceover and it, it's becoming more and more common and it's not great. It's not. And I've, I've heard cause I follow one of the subreddits I follow is partnered YouTube. Cause I, I'm a YouTube uh, right. partner for my watch channel. And, and some people will be like, I'm not getting, you know, like I tried to get partnered or I tried to get monetized. I'm not. And, and one of the things like people, if they share their links, people will give feedback like, what do I need to do to fix it? And they're like, all right, uh, you've got way your AI, con you're doing AI audio like YouTube supposedly cracking down on this. Like they're not partnering a lot of people that are just doing a bunch of AI dreck where you assembled a bunch of clips and decided that you needed it. Like, what are you making? Like, it's not your voice. It's not your original content. So you're gluing other people's work together <clears throat> and then you can't even be bothered to voice over it. So it's some of that uh, yeah. pushback. And I've seen some channels that started to do like the AI people talking and then they went back to just the AI voiceovers. Uh, so it's like, I don't know. Uh, but it, I mean, I will give it, I mean, this, this is the first time I believe I had heard the LM notebook AI version. And I will say, well, especially when the longer content, you can hear certain things where the inflections and stuff aren't natural. They're, Even in the shorter content, yeah, you can feel though, it. If you go back and listen to that barrels of fun, the way they say fun, she says fun, it's wrong. It sounds like they didn't know how to pronounce fun quite right. Uh, 
but it was interesting. Like they had some other like little trail offs. Uh, there was a part in some of the audio where, at least in the longer audio, where the male voice actually uh, pops his, he's too close to his mic and it gets that pop effect uh, to make it sound more like how a podcast is. But here's the thing where they deserve the full, full kudos. That AI successfully captured just how much truly meaning, meaning, meaningless drivel we do to sustain these shows. Just, oh yeah, no, wow, that would be real. I mean, I, t- I think back and I'm like, you know what? We do use this as a tactic in podcasting quite a bit where it's just sort of like, let's take this, let's talk about what's going to come up at Expo. How many shows are doing that? We didn't just because we didn't bother, but right. we've done it for Texas and stuff. We've done yeah. it before. And it's just like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting? What will this next theme be? The lowest hanging of the lowest hanging fruits. The rumors. People sometimes write in and ask me about bringing back Rumor Corner. You guys got too reliant on Rumor Corner. That's why it's not here anymore. That The point of Rumor the Corner. The Jones in for the rumor fix. The point of Rumor Corner was to make fun of rumors. And it just, people started to take it too seriously. And it's like, that that's all this hobby is, is wanting to talk about what's next, what's next, what's next. That's not what all the other, like, I have other hobbies. That's not what that's all about. But in right. pinball it is. And it's sort of. And, and, that, and you're, you're right. That's very interesting to see the difference between how pinball handles stuff like that and other hobbies. Do you think it's because we just don't have enough releases? Like, it's, like, in watches, there are releases every week. So there's there's a little bit of, oh, well, will Rolex do this? But there's, there's I mean, there's I think, just so much new stuff. You don't care about the rumors st- side. Like, the people, content creators aren't, like, milking that. Right, because, and, and they very well could be. And see, most of the content that I, and the hobbies I do and the content I listen to outside of pinball are more, um, like, 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 well, I mean, camping and adventure and, 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 and doing stuff like that. Uh, and most of their content isn't about, whoa, this blank company has this new fancy what a widget coming out. Most of it's like, yeah, hey, we're going to the Grand Tetons and we'll show some video and, and then, we'll talk about it. And, and like in video like games, like we know years in advance what the themes are. Right. So it's that's why I've always found it so foreign with. Uh, yeah, there's with an pinball. Elder Scroll coming. Did you hear? Yes, I did. I did. I heard. I also heard there's a new Borderlands thing coming out soon. Yeah. Right after a really bad movie. <laughs> Gotta watch that taste out. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to video games. And uh, we do have another listener email uh, from Chris C. So Chris wrote in Hey, guys, given my proximity to TPF, feel free to read this in a redneck accent or toss it through an AI to simplify things. No, we're no, not doing that, Chris. We're not doing that. Chris. You, AI, AI, we're just going to give you a southern accent. Getting bad. Wanted to provide a recommendation for the listener looking for a resource to learn more about retro video game history. While I'll admit it took me a bit to get used to their quirkiness, the They Create Worlds podcast focuses primarily on the business and people side of retro video games. So, not reviews, rather the hows and whys of corporate mergers, spinoffs, how technical limitations, competition, markets, drove game design, etc. Coincidentally, I think they might be from the KC area as well. Uh, Chris did provide a link uh, that is in the show notes. So if you want to go, uh, it'll take you to the about section because they have like a blog and stuff in addition to the podcast. But um, I haven't listened to it yet, but I wanted to go ahead and get that shared. So thank you, Chris, for writing in and providing that because that was a request from a listener on a prior episode. You mentioned Elder Scrolls, which I makes did. me think Bethesda. Right. Is there Bethesda news there for us? There is Bethesda news. Well, how fortuitous. Bethesda uh, had just recently released their new uh, story expansion for Starfield. Mm, uh, so many stars. And in the lead up to that expansion, uh, Games Radar interviewed their design director, Emil. I can't pronounce his last name. I'm not even going to try. I'd, I would just slaughter it. Uh, but he was talking about the expansion and they asked him, what making the RPG taught the studio that it will carry into future product projects. And his answer was fans really, really want elder scroll six. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> he also followed by saying that he feels good about Starfield's future, uh, and that they have more exciting stuff coming. Also that he's very excited about their mod community. Cause it is modded so heavily, that he sees Starfield moving beyond just being the game and becoming a platform for science fiction and space content. Mm. So, uh, 
He also followed that up by stating that in a lot of ways, it's the best game they've ever done. Mm. And the derision from that comment mm-hmm. the, online was such that he had to go to social media to uh, follow up. Uh, and he said, quote, maybe it's a game of expectations. Fans want a lot and we do all we can to accommodate them. Here's what I can tell you. Nobody, and I mean nobody at Bethesda, is patting themselves on the back while ignoring our players. He also acknowledged uh, that in addition to delivering Shattered Space, which is the new uh, expansion, that Bethesda has spent a lot of the time this year addressing the community concerns and making fixes. He added, we'll continue to do so and we'll be listening to our fans every step of the way. We make these games for you. As he did all of the damage control he could possibly do. You've played Starfield. Yeah, I have finished it. It was on my list and I kind of backed you got off talked of it, out of it. When the, as the review started coming. So, uh, but you, you, you dove straight into mm-hmm. it. So how's I the did. mod community? Well, I don't do the mod. <sighs> I know. Because I'm on console. I'm not a proper player. I'm a fake <laughs> gamer. So I would know about the mods. I, you know, there are probably some weird ones and there are probably some that are quality of life uh, that would make the game more playable. I mean, to, to be fair, it doesn't have like a Preston situation with starfield right from fallout 4 uh just like a truly annoying thing i think the biggest thing that was a nice too but it wasn't it wasn't like battlefield 2042 was bringing in the car so you could finally drive around because sometimes the landing sites were pretty far away from where you needed to go but that pretty far away was still like less than a minute of walking it wasn't like in battlefield 2042 you could be out running for minutes and then the sniper takes you because you weren't anywhere near a vehicle oh what a failure of a game and i so love dice shooters so much too um yeah no it's just you know it's a new franchise and i or i think they hoped it was a new franchise i wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being just a one-off uh game that kind of lives as it is and maybe it gets to a i mean it had some ideas to it i it's just I think what they lost sight of is what makes a space game fun and what makes games like Elder Scrolls and Fallout fun. And they didn't really go either way as fully as they would need to. Like they didn't have the same depth of questing and just go out and, and, and travel around and explore that you would have in an Elder Scrolls or a Fallout Um but then when they go into space, instead of like doing some of like the wing commander esque sort of things or X wing tie fighter sort of things, it's like they just it made it so expansive, and then you just fast travel everywhere, so it doesn't feel like you're flying a ship. Yeah, in 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 low orbit or whatever, you'll 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 engage in some ship combat, but it's really just a a fast travel system. And they have fast travel systems in their other games. Once you get to places, you can fast travel, but Sometimes you want to go on the adventure and journey. In Starfield, you can't. And you land on these planets where you can, and there's nothing there. There's very few planets that have any sort of life on them. So how many moons do you want to land on where you can go and find the 12 different elements that you could possibly mine that you don't need any of that stuff for? Because honestly, you don't care. Because all it's used for is base building, which is pointless. It's just, it doesn't do any one thing great. Is maybe a good way to say it. Uh, some of the side uh, quest storylines are pretty good, so it still has some good writing. Yeah, when you get and do that, but that's not what most of that game is. The game is like this: imagine a bathtub, and the bathtub is the universe of Starfield, and then the places you can land on it are soap bubbles. But most of the soap bubbles are just bubble. There's nothing to it. It's it. There's no flavor to it. It's just sadness. It just and all so, tastes like soap. And then you toss in your rubber duckies and stuff. And those are the worlds where there are actual things to do. But there are only a few rubber duckies that float on a bathtub. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely see where it, it's open world, but not a well-populated yeah. open world. It's vacant. Yeah. It's open, but vacant. What's the point in going and exploring, exploring an infinite universe if there's nothing in it? And that's... Yeah, they it's like it feels like they they auto generated a bunch of planets and moons and but most of them just like in space, most of them are barren. So again, unless It's a you, realism simulator. It, yeah, it's a realism simulator, but I it's just it's not I don't know. It 
it doesn't do it in a way where you can achieve achieve the zen of like power washer simulator which is a realism simulator i suppose in its own kind it's like why right i played that and i got motion sick so i had to stop but while i was playing i was kind of like why don't I just go outside and power wash if I'm going to play a game? Of the- I, uh, well, I don't have my own power washer, but if I did, why don't I just go and use my own power because washer? Because then you'd have to be outside in the heat, and and it's yeah. loud and noisy, and it's just annoying. I I, I kind of feel the same way because like like I've been playing Satisfactory a lot, which is just a factory building game where you're just building factories to build parts. So you, you're like you mine resources, use those resources to build equipment, to make factories, we use those factories to make parts, use those parts to make other factories, to make other parts, to eventually like just ship them up off of a space elevator. Uh, and, but it's, it's deeply engrossing, not because of an overall story or even your goal, but like, when I played yesterday, I I knew I needed to start setting up a new factory uh, because I had access some new, to some new resources, and I ended up spending all of my playtime yesterday exploring the world, just kind of running around and running into things and seeing what was going on. Uh, so I didn't get done what I needed to get done, for, but I had a good time just being in the world. Because it's a well populated world with a lot of stuff and, and, and everything's laid out and it's curated. So No, definitely I think it's something that we'll see more of uh how they decide what information they take from this to try and make things better. And obviously they know they need to get an Elder Scrolls out. You know, they only announced it in twenty eighteen. Yeah, it's just to be fair, fine. I mean, it's, uh, you know, especially you get it at a discount now. It's not a bad game. Uh, just don't go into it expecting it to be like Elder Scrolls in space. It's not. Right. The, uh, and to be fair to their announcement of Elder Scrolls 6 in 2018, they literally announced that like at the last second because they had to because people mm. were so upset. Yes. Right. So. It, it, it was one of those. Uh, we're 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 working on it, and the working on it is they've got like three guys who said mm. who've said we should probably start making Elder Scrolls Six. Ah, make the announcement! Make the announcement! So yes, um, we've talked a little bit in the past also about the 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 a Quiet Place the Road game that's coming out that's based off the Quiet Place movies, and they have an inter they they that's coming out very soon, but they have announced an interesting little option for it that it allows you to engage your microphone while you're playing so that actual noise around you while you're playing the game can trigger the creatures in the game. You know, if you want to make it harder Mm -hmm. because, you know, the dog starts barking at somebody outside or you cough or, or, or you're, you know, the doorbell rings because pizza has been delivered or whatever. Uh, I just thought it's an interesting little bit of added stuff to the game that doesn't require much for them in the way to put in, but because of the theme, uh, just plays interestingly. They um, this was done with Alien Isolation. It was uh, back when all the Xboxes were were to have connects, right? So the Connect microphone would allow the Xenomorph to know where you were, and. They get they. I don't know if they had it from the get go, but they at least eventually put in an option to turn that off because yes, if you're, you know, people were talking in the other room and that the alien was knew where you were all the time. <laughs> it was just it, it became yeah. a. But this yes. is very much an opt in, not an opt yes. out from the sounds I, I, uh, if, from the sounds. If of they it. didn't have it in from the get go, they got it in really really quick. It was in by the time I started playing that game. So and I got <laughs> that game pretty early because I, I I would definitely it's definitely something that. Uh, me and a house full of people playing something like that would definitely have it turned off because between three dogs and the wife and kids and everything else going on, there's, I would but, just be constantly. I, I mean, I could see some people like, you know, I mean, one of my favorite things with like uh, the uh, evil within and stuff would be to wait until it was night and play with all the lights out and, you know, get that full horror immersion. So, and that, that would definitely put to that whole immersion. That'd be pretty good. Uh, we talked a lot about Blizzard and the issues over the last couple of years, and uh, Bloomberg reporter Jason Schreier uh, is actually putting out a book called Play Nice, The Rise, Fall, and Future of Blizzard in Entertainment mm. uh, that is releasing here shortly. Uh, and it's based on firsthand interviews with 300 current and former employees, and that covers the entire history of the company from the very beginning up until the layoffs earlier this year. I might year. add that to my list. Yeah, uh, I looked at it. The... Uh, 
audiobook version of it is TPF lengthable. It's oh. just over nine hours. Okay. Huh. So because I, I looked mm. as soon as I saw like hmm. Well, that could be a good road trip one. It could then. be a good road trip. And then one. it gives us content to talk about yes. with the listeners. Or to have our AI versions talk with the listeners. Yes. <laughs> Let us know if we should just AI ourselves and uh you guys want to listen to Eclectic Gamers Podcast AI edition. <laughs> right into Eclectic <laughs> the Gamers Eclectic Podcast. AI AI edition. We can see if the AI can uh, emulate our voices. They have so many samples to pull from, I bet they could. Zach wants to use some AI tool to get me to sing uh, Radiohead's creep. And he put it on the episode. That is disturbing. Yes, it was. I can think of much better songs mm-hmm. that we could do. Well, it didn't really have me sing; it just had me speak, sing it. So it wasn't. So you were. So it was more my fair lady. Yes. There you go. Yes. Oh well. There were rumors last week uh, popping up all over the place that Ubisoft was in the middle of a discussion with Tencent to be sold off Mm. uh, and taken private. Uh, Ubisoft, primarily known at this point for Assassin's Creed as their main thing. Um, But uh, Ubisoft has come out and said that they regularly review all strategic options in the interest of its stakeholders and will inform the market if and when it is appropriate. Mm. which is one of those, mm. Mm, yeah, sure, we've looked at stuff, but we're not saying nothing. Yeah. You can't get me saying nothing, Kappa. Yeah. Deals are in the works. So uh, sales of Star Wars Outlaw was very weak, and the, and partially because of that, they have delayed the release of the next Assassin's Creed game from November, so it would be a holiday release mm-hmm. until February. Wow. So that shows a very large lack of faith in that game's quality is yes. what I see. Because just because Star Wars Outlaw sales were weak, I don't think that would be the yeah, only reason I mean, to withhold, especially an Assassin's Creed game from out of the holiday season completely. I mean, I because I don't understand, would they, is the, is the dream to goose Outlaw sales somehow? Or because otherwise, why not just move on and, and cut your losses and say, we got to get Assassin's Creed out for sure for the holiday season because... Because right. Outlaws is not going to sell. That's what to me would make sense, but I think it's that the I don't think the game is polished enough, mm. and I think yeah, that would they're they're at a point where they're like we can't afford to drop another game that needs massive amounts of bug fixes and tweaks after launch. We can't take the the hit uh, anymore. So. We'll see, because that adds, like I said, that takes it out. They lose that loses in the holiday season for an Assassin's Creed game. That's huge. Um. Genshin Impact, which a game we would like almost never talk about. No, but it's huge. It's it's huge. I, we know people. Who play I know it. lots of people who play it. My my daughter plays it all the time. Uh, its latest edition or its latest um, uh, update is not fully voiced in English because I of the SAG after strike. So or. It's believed to be because of the mm. SAG after strike. They say it's not because uh, due to issues with recording arrangements. Oh. So, yes, from a strike. Yeah, from the strike. So uh, it looks like that that is an ongoing issue. I know we've talked about in the past about the strike. There's been no real updates because as far as I know, there's been no real change in mm. the strike. The strike is still ongoing since the strike was specifically laid out in such a way that it only ha- affected new content and not stuff that was already under contract. It doesn't, everything that's being worked on currently is still being worked right. on. So we it, hadn't felt the effects uh, and nor have the businesses, but as those projects wind down and new projects need to get started, they're going to, in theory, feel, finally feel this pressure. Right. And I think this is probably the Do you first think the event. strike is what impacted Alice in Wonderland's voice work for call outs? I doubt it because they're out of Europe and Europe's not SAG AFTRA. Mm. Okay. Because there were big issues. Uh, I remember. I don't know. Rem- I do not remember if I talked about it on the uh, on the podcast, but I remember there were articles where some of the voice actor unions in Europe were working on deals with SAG AFTRA specifically to not allow their people to be replacements mm. for people on, on stuff. Okay. So, because I was going to say that the voice work on the in the trailer sounded like scabs to me. It's scab work. Uh, I'm sure. It's, uh, I, the more I think of it, the more I think it's probably AI. Hmm. So AI's everywhere. This is like our AI episode. We've had multiple discussions. AI, AI. continues to gain steam. 
Speaking of steam. What? Wow, what a transition, Dennis. Woo. Uh, Steam is now warning customers at purchase that they are only buying a license for digital content and not outright owning it. Uh, California passed a law in September that goes into effect on January uh, 1st that prohibits sellers from using words buy, purchase, or any other term that a reasonable person would understand to confer unrestricted ownership interest in a digital good. Mm -hmm. So Steam is just putting that in there ahead of time to cover their bases. So it's one of those things that I think Anybody buying digital only versions of anything has known for a while, but and a frustration as it becomes harder and harder to get an actual purchase option, right? Because a lot of them, a lot of games don't release any form of purchase option, or if they do release an actual disc, the disc just has a link, yeah, to the, it just downloads, it, it just downloads. You it. own the disc, but the disc doesn't actually have the game on it, right? So there's no. It's still just a disc that says, oh, it's a license. I remember that was one of my original big hate-ons for Steam before mm-hmm. I embraced the Steam. That's right. You was fell that in I had the, the It was Civilization Four, and I bought the disc, and when I installed, put the disc in my computer, it made me install Steam so I could download it into my Steam account. Mm-hmm. And that was one of my original hate-ons for Steam. Yep. Took me a so lot of years to ago. get over that. Yeah. So long ago. We're up to what, Civilization Six now? I think. So um and the last thing I want to cover, Game Freak, mm-hmm. which is the creators of Pokemon. I didn't uh, remember that. Yeah, Game Freak is the the main uh group in Japan uh that owns oversees all of Pokemon. Mm. Uh they received what they've been calling a giga hack. <laughs> it is such a giga massive hack. hack, and they've had so much information stolen uh that it is enormous. Um, just the littlest touches of it, uh, uh, is the entire source code for heart gold and soul silver. It has been leaked, uh, beta, uh, source codes for older games has been leaked. Uh, original sprites, original animations and art for older games is out there. Um, Information on unannounced games, including a Splatoon-like game, is out there. Some of the information is lost is from something that's just called MMO Test. <laughs> uh, they have tons and tons of internal notes that have been re- uh, released. Uh, it includes the they're referring internally, at least to the Switch Two, as ounce. Mm. Um, the there's been information released about three live action Pokemon movies, uh, including a pair of Detective Pikachu movies, and then yet an, a third non related movie, mm, Surgeon Pikachu, uh, maybe. <laughs> and then, uh, and that includes uh, a complete script for a movie that it's not been announced or nobody knows if it's gone forward or if it died or what. Uh, it's also included uh, meeting notes, including reportedly the notes uh, from the meetings where they were discussing the end of the Ash Pikachu era in the animation mm. and, and the ways to handle it and to get it so that the fan base doesn't go insane. Yes. Uh, with their hatred. Kill him. So that's not how they did it. By Pikachu's hand. They, they specifically did it so that it was uh, in the no- from what I've seen in the notes, it was specifically done in a way so that it's the whole and their journey continues, and mm. then they can they they're just we're just not gonna follow them anymore mm. as he lives in his coma because he's been dead since the first episode. Sad, so sad. But no, this is actually a huge leak for a giga leak. Yeah, it was evolved it's the giga leak. Giga leak. That's right. <laughs> it has a mega evolution of a yes. leak. Yes. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll get rid of it and they'll find a new special thing That's for the right. next leak. The next one will be the Terra Leak. Magikarp uses fish. Magikarp is successful. <laughs> <laughs> Gloom. <laughs> yes, that's what but you impacted all of them. Yeah. They're, they, they, they all they are all under gloom. Mm. So uh but that's all I have for today, really. Uh okay. I just well Yeah. 
Well, I think we gave them a lot. So we did. If they want to write to us about any of that stuff. They can do so at eclectic gamers podcast at gmail.com. They could go to facebook.com slash eclectic gamers podcast as well because we do post there. Also, if you want to support the channel, it's as low as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash eclectic underscore gamers. Uh, we're available on Twitch and Instagram. Instagram as eclectic underscore gamers. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks. We are not going to Expo, so we. We might cover some of the stuff that we learn from Expo. Right. The rumors swirl greatly about greatly things, but we won't actually be there because we're too good for Chicago. Until then, (laughs) my name is Dennis. I'm Tony. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.